thank you so much for the invitation to speak. These are my disclosures. And I'll add the explanation that I'm focusing on cisgender women, meaning individuals who are assigned female at birth and identify as girls or women. And for simplicity, I will be referring to this population as women. This heat map shows the proportional burden of HIV among women worldwide. Globally, women comprise half of new HIV cases. And to give you a sense of magnitude, every week an estimated 5,000 young women become infected with HIV. In resource-rich settings, such as North America and Central and Western Europe, Women comprise 20 to 25% of new cases. However, in Sub-Saharan Africa, which has the heaviest caseload of HIV, women, particularly young women, make up more than half of new cases. In this region, six out of seven new HIV infections among adolescents are among girls. The vast majority of women in both resource-rich and resource-limited settings acquire HIV through sexual transmission. HIV incidence among women is enabled by an estimated eight-fold higher sexual transmission efficiency from men to women. But the HIV pandemic among women and girls is not due to these biological differences between men and women. The HIV pandemic among women is driven by gender inequity and compounded by poverty. And HIV prevention in women remains underfunded and understudied relative to the pervasiveness and severity of the pandemic. HIV is now highly preventable through behavioral interventions, namely barrier contraception, and through pharmacoprevention, known as pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. Barrier contraception, specifically male condom use, is notably limited by issues of partner power discordance, in addition to cost, stigma, and religious interdicts. Male condom use is implicitly dependent upon partner cooperation, highlighting the need for women-controlled HIV prevention options, such as PrEP. There are now several approved PrEP drugs for women and many more in the pipeline. Both daily oral and longer acting PrEP formulations offer an autonomous option for HIV prevention prior to risk exposure, circumventing the need for skills enactment or cooperation from sex partners. Tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate and emtricitabine, or FTDF, is a daily oral pill and up until recently was the only approved PrEP option for women. What we learned from Partners PrEP and from TDF2 is that when taken daily, FTDF increases HIV transmission by greater than 90% in heterosexual couples. What we learned from the FemTrep and VOICE trials, however, is that the effectiveness of FTDF in women is critically dependent upon adherence. And you can see on this graph of the FTDF clinical trials the career relationship between effectiveness and the presence of detectable drug levels. What we also know now is that near-perfect adherence is required in cisgender women to achieve the same greater than 90% efficacy demonstrated in men who have sex with men. And this is secondary to 10 to 15 fold differences in drug concentrations between cervical, vaginal, and colorectal tissues. While on the topic of oral PrEP, it's important to review the daily oral PrEP option that is not currently approved for cisgender women. Tenofovir elephenamide and emtricitabine, or FTAF, is only approved in men who have sex with men and transgender women with potential exposure to HIV through receptive anal intercourse. It has the potential benefit of having less systemic exposure and thus less impact on bone mineral density and renal function. FTAP has been extensively studied as treatment in men and women with HIV. However, as cisgender women were not included in the DISCOVER trial for PrEP, we lack efficacy data specific to cisgender women, and it has not been approved for this indication in this population. Gilead Science is now conducting the Women's HIV Prevention Study in Sub-Saharan Africa to evaluate the efficacy of FTAP and lenacapavir, a new injectable option. The Depivirine vaginal ring is a monthly self-inserted intravaginal silicone ring which offers tissue level protection like a topical microbicide. The ASPIRE trial found that HIV incidence was 27% lower among women in the tibivirine ring group compared to placebo. And additionally, subgroup analyses indicated increased efficacy in subgroups with higher adherence. Similarly, the ring study found a 31% lower incidence compared to placebo. And based on the, the results of the ASPIRE trial and the ring study, the WHO has endorsed the Pivarine ring as an additional prevention option among women with substantial risk of HIV, and it has been approved in several African countries at greatest need of HIV prevention. It was previously under consideration by the UF US FDA, but the application was withdrawn due to low probability of approval. While the Depivirine ring does not offer the same efficacy as daily oral FTDF prep, it offers a viable monthly alternative for HIV prevention in women who are not able to take a daily oral regimen due to pill burden. The bottom line is that increasing effective prep options that are both accessible and acceptable to women is critically important to ending the HIV epidemic. 
cabotegravir or CAB is a long acting injection given every two months. HPTN 084 compared the safety and efficacy of long acting CAB compared to daily oral FTDF. The interim analysis found that both agents were highly effective in preventing HIV. However, CAB was significantly superior with an 89% lower risk of HIV infection in participants in the CAB group, due at least in part likely to the adherence advantage of an every eight week injection compared to a daily oral pill. And there are more options on the way. I can't even tell you how exciting this, this schema of HIV prevention options is. And with the new multipurpose prevention technologies or MPTs that co-formulate PrEP with contraception, it is better than Christmas for an OBGYN. In the PrEP pipeline, you can see a multitude of standalone PrEP options, um, as well as options in the forms of MPTs that include implants, patches, injections, inserts, diaphragms, vaginal rings, and oral pills. And there are two critical points here. The first is choice. What we've learned over the decades in family planning is that there's no one right formulation or delivery system for everyone. And at least in contraception, more options translate into more utilization of both older and newer methods. The second critical point is although these MPTs offer the potential to bridge gaps in sexual and reproductive health and are responsive to what women want, it is critically important to involve women, especially women at greatest risk of HIV and across the globe at all stages from product development through rollout to ensure successful and equitable provision of this new PrEP technology. And while I'm hesitant to temper my excitement surrounding successes in recent clinical trials and tremendous progress in terms of autonomous HIV prevention options for women, I would be remiss not to acknowledge that despite the safety and efficacy of existing PrEP options, the rollout has not been without considerable challenges. You can see in the graph on the left that we have fallen short of the UN AIDS target for 2020. Among the female designated key populations, just under half of female sex workers and approximately one third of adolescent girls and young women have started PrEP. The graphic on the right demonstrates the regional distribution with the highest uptake appropriately in Sub-Saharan Africa. To explore these challenges on the ground level, I will switch gears at this point and focus on PrEP utilization or rather underutilization among women in the United States to share our experiences and lessons learned, many of which are applicable globally. For context, in the U.S. setting, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, estimates that PrEP coverage is only 6.6% for women. To start with some background, this slide depicts the incidence of HIV among women in the U.S., and over the past two decades, there's been a downward trend in the associated with an overall decrease in heterosexual transmission, down 25% among Black women, 20% among Latinas, and stable among white women. And although the downward trend is good news, the racial disparities in HIV acquisition are still stark. The pie chart on the left shows the proportions of HIV diagnoses by race compared to the pie chart on the right, which shows national and uh, racial and ethnic breakdowns among women. 58% of new HIV cases are among Black women, despite only comprising 13% of the U.S. population. And bearing in mind these pie charts from the previous slide, you'll notice the obvious disparities in PrEP utilization in the U.S., Women comprise between 20 to 30% of incident HIV infections across the U.S., but only 4.6% of PrEP users. And despite the disproportionate burden of HIV among communities of color, among female PrEP users, 48% were white, while only 26% were Black and 18% Latina. Given the low utilization of PrEP, we set out to implement an educational intervention for providers and female patients in a government-run sexual health clinic with the goal of integrating universal PrEP services for women. We selected a clinic-based intervention given the influence of medical providers that women themselves indicated both in the literature and in our own formative research. And in selecting this clinical site in urban Washington, DC, we selected a patient population that was largely black and living below the federal poverty line and a population of women who were largely seeking STI testing and treatment and by definition met the CDC PrEP eligibility criteria at the time of having unprotected sex in a high prevalence area. The literature indicated low knowledge and comfort around PrEP among providers and our focus group research among women additionally demonstrated very low awareness of PrEP but high interest after introduction. Thus, we were under the optimistic impression that education was the missing ingredient to improve engagement in the PrEP cascade. To achieve this, we implemented clinic-wide trainings and a prompt in the electronic health, health record to encourage providers to screen and discuss PrEP. In the clinic waiting area, we played educational videos on PrEP to increase awareness and knowledge among patients. 
The data I'll present today is from a REAM-AIM implementation analysis and was presented in part at CROI and is currently under review. 1,720 women were seen during the one-year intervention period and were compared to 329 women during the pre-implementation period. Chart review revealed the mean age was 29 years and the majority of the women were black and reported a median of two risk factors for HIV acquisition in addition to living in a high HIV prevalence community. The most common risk factors were inconsistent condom use, multiple sex partners, and an STI in the past 12 months. The implementation of the intervention itself was found to be highly feasible and acceptable to both medical providers and ancillary staff at minimal cost. The proportion of women screened for PrEP increased from a mean of 5.6% pre-intervention to 89.5% during the intervention period. The proportion of women offered PrEP increased from 6.2% pre-intervention to 69.8% during the intervention period. And lastly, the proportion of women prescribed or initiating PrEP increased less dramatically but significantly from 2.6% to 8.1% during the intervention period. In the PrEP cascade during the intervention period, you can see the dramatic drop-off between the proportion of women who were offered PrEP and those who initiated. And unfortunately, this drop-off in the cascade is not unique to DC or even to the United States. So in spite of our, despite our successes, we were bothered by the low uptake in PrEP relative to the reported behavioral exposures of the patient population. And reflecting on the limitations of our educational intervention, it was not that the educational intervention was ineffective or that provider and patient education is unimportant. It was simply inadequate to overcome barriers such as competing priorities, medical mistrust, and stigma. Barriers that we were aware of, but frankly underestimated. And I would advocate that future PrEP implementation necessarily include multi-level socio-structural interventions to address these. To bring this back out to a global level and to further illustrate my last point regarding the complexity of PrEP for women and need for multi-level interventions, I have borrowed Brenner's socio-ecological model. The model posits that individuals' decisions and behaviors result from reciprocal interactions within and between individuals and their social, cultural, and institutional and structural environments. On the individual level, especially in high prevalence areas, perceived risk of HIV acquisition lags actual behavioral exposure. And many women are not aware of PrEP or aware that it's an option for them. Additionally, in many settings, medical mistrust undermines public health efforts and interventions to improve PrEP uptake. And among women who do initiate PrEP, adherence to daily oral PrEP is a struggle due to side effects and pill burden. Interpersonally, power discordance in relationships with sexual partners often dissuades women from initiating PrEP due to concerns about partners' reactions and disapproval. And as social beings, a lack of perceived support from friends and social networks has been reported by women as a barrier to their utilization. On the community level, the stigma of taking a drug associated with HIV and sexual promiscuity unfortunately dissuades many women from initiating PrEP. And on the institutional, or in this case, health system level, provider low knowledge and low comfort prescribing PrEP, as well as racial and sex biases and prescription practices, hinder equitable prescription of PrEP for women, as do insufficient resources. And lastly, issues of PrEP availability and acceptability continue to be a struggle, both for oral PrEP and especially for newer formulations. So in conclusion, the HIV epidemic disproportionately affects women in under-resourced settings. And the utilization of oral PrEP for HIV prevention has been suboptimal due to a host of factors ranging from disparities in rollout, inequities in prescription practices, stigma, and low awareness of PrEP. The successes in clinical trials and new PrEP options in the pipeline offer the promise of increased individual choice in PrEP modality and formulation, especially MPTs. And with these new formulations, we need to make sure there's true equity and availability and accessibility of PrEP for women on both the global and local scales. I would posit that along with both new and existing PrEP options, we need socio-structural interventions to address these multi-level barriers to PrEP utilization among women. We celebrated the hallmark of PrEP as an HIV prevention option for women that would be women-controlled, autonomous, discreet, effective, non-negotiable, and available for women at risk of HIV acquisition. But this does not align with the on-the-ground experience. PrEP can be all these things, but we have not yet created the structures and systems or adequately modified existing structures and systems to actualize this for women. But as an OBGYN and a woman and the mother of a strong-willed and vigorous little girl, I am hopeful. And I believe that together we can and will strive towards equity and accessibility in PrEP and HIV prevention for women. 
And on that note, this work takes a village. Big thank yous to my mentors, research team, and collaborators. And lastly, to my patients and research participants who teach me so much and inspire me with their strength and resilience. And I'm happy to take any questions in the panel discussion.